Hello again. Welcome to part two of What About the Dinosaurs? Perhaps before starting this section, it might be good to review what was covered in part one. First of all, we talked about the precepts of men and that in the last days there would be but few humble followers of Christ but that in many instances they do err because they are taught by the precepts of men. And where are we taught these precepts? Well, in school. We also learn that the, that the Lord is not particularly happy with those who cling to the precepts of men. Part one of the video also suggested that creation-based scientists question that the earth is old enough to allow for the process of evolution as secular scientists theorize. As a, an aside, creation scientists actually believe that the earth is quite young, possibly six to ten thousand years old, that Heavenly Father, when he created the earth, he created it, put the plants and animals and man on it, and got going right away. That's quite different than what we learn in school. The creation scientists also suggest that when everything is done, that the Earth will be um, essentially celestialized, receive its um, celestial glory in a relatively short period of time. The Heavenly Father built this Earth for man to inhabit and um, not to hang around for a long, long, long time doing nothing. With this in mind, let's proceed and take a look at some rather compelling and stunning evidence that dinosaurs perhaps didn't live hundreds of millions of years ago, but they're actually quite recent. This particular slide has some very interesting information on it. In about 2010, Dr. Mary Schweitzer did something no one else had ever done before. She took the um, inside of a T-Rex femur bone put it under the microscope, and you know what she found? She observed what appeared to be blood vessels and red blood cells. Ultimately, her insistence on her findings, sticking to what she found, got her fired from the university that she was at. However, subsequently, this has been replicated by other scientists with uh, bones from other dinosaurs. Well, that's created somewhat of a problem as to how could blood cells exist in the fossil of a um, dinosaur that supposedly lived uh, millions and millions and millions of years ago. This is a classic example of what they call in science a maintained hypothesis. That's the state where rather than having the evidence inform the hypothesis, the hypothesis hypothesis informs the evidence. In this case, the evidence suggests that perhaps the hypothesis that the Earth is billion, billions of years old and that dinosaurs evolved through an evolutionary process ought to be at question. But rather, that hypothesis is maintained in favor of altering our view of the evidence. That is, soft tissue and blood are able to persist in fossils over hundreds of millions of years. Some examples of this um, from science is, are things like the Earth is flat and the Sun revolves around the Earth. These hypotheses were maintained for thousands of years despite evidence to the contrary. Science seems to be one long history of maintained hypotheses. This uh, can be illustrated really well by looking at the Smithsonian Institute. What they had to say about Mary Schweitzer is that her research had been hijacked by young earth creationists in support of a young earth rather than an earth that's billions and billions of years old. Can uh, blood cells and soft tissue exist for a few thousand years? Well, the answer is yes, we know that. We can see this from mummies in Egypt. And the Tyrolean Iceman. Talking about mummies leads us to the next uh, figure on the slide. 
I quote from a, an article in the Huffington Post dated uh, May 14, 2017. After more than 100 million years encased in stone, an impeccably preserved dragon-like dinosaur has been unveiled by paleontologists in Canada. It's unlike anything they've seen before. The remains of an armor-plated notosaur, a 3,000-pound plant-eating horned creature, went on display in Alberta after its accidental discovery by miners nearly six years ago, unquote. So, this is interesting because what they have here is a mummy of a dinosaur, not a fossil of a dinosaur, that is supposed to be millions and millions and millions of years old, 110 million years old. That seems like a very stretch of the imagination. So instead of suggesting that we need to revise our theories on how long soft tissue and blood vessels can remain um, from thousands of years to millions of years, perhaps maybe what should be revised is the hypothesis that the dinosaurs lived hundreds of millions of years ago. In 1944, as a 10-year-old boy, Newton Anderson was fueling the coal furnace in his parents' home. He dropped a lump of coal onto the basement floor and it broke in half, revealing that it contained this bale inside. The coal that was mined near his house in Upshur County, West Virginia, is supposed to be about 300 million years old. What is a brass bell with an iron clapper doing in coal? The bell was submitted to the lab at the University of Oklahoma. There, a nuclear activation analysis revealed that the bell contains an unusual mix of metals, different from any known modern alloy production, including copper, zinc, tin, arsenic, iodine, and selenium. More recently, a resident of Vladivostok, sandwiched between China, North Korea, and the Sea of Japan, was adding ordinary coal to a fire when he noticed a shiny metal ob object peeking through a piece of the black rock. The portion that protruded looked suspiciously man-made, so he investigated by enlisting the help of nearby scientists. The shiny metal bar had teeth, as though it was designed to mesh with the teeth of a wheeled gear. X-ray diffraction revealed that it was mostly aluminum, with about 2 or 4 percent magnesium. This unique alloy is not generally produced today. The artifacts found in coal suggest one of two things. Either people were around a very, very, very long time ago, much earlier than we suppose today, or it doesn't take coal hundreds of millions of years to develop. The arguments on how coal formed between scientists who take an evolutionary approach and those who take a creationist perspective is fairly complicated and involves a lot of different variables and arguments. It all boils down to really one thing. Evolutionists believe that things have always been as they are now that the principles and the, the way things are today have always existed. Creationists believe that prior to the flood, things were quite different, that the earth um, was a much different place prior to the flood. And that's essentially the difference in the two perspectives. If one believes that things have always been the way they are today, then it would take a long time to create the volume and mass of coal that exists on the earth today. If one believes that things prior to the flood were much different, much more lush, um, a different place, then one could see how there would be sufficient material there to create all the coal during the flood. Tiny quiz. What came first, the sun or the earth? Well, if you were talking to someone who believed that the Earth is really old and that um, evolution produced everything that we have, one would believe that the Sun and the Earth are about the same age, but that the Sun is older. If you believe in the scriptures, you will notice that the Earth was created 
first and the sun came uh, much later. At this point I'd like to read from 10 Best Evidences from Science that Confirm a Young Earth by Dr. Danny R. Faulkner, dated uh, 2012. A comet spends most of its time far from the sun in deep freeze of space, but each orbit a comet comes very close to the sun, allowing the sun's heat to evaporate much of the comet's ice and dislodge dust to form a beautiful tail. Comets have little mass, so each close pass to the sun greatly reduces a comet's size, about 5% each time, and eventually comets fade away. They simply can't survive billions of years. Two other mechanisms can destroy comets, ejections from the solar system and collisions with planets. Ejections happen as comets pass too close to the large planets, particularly Jupiter, and the planet's gravity kicks them out of the solar system. While ejections have been observed many times, the first observed collision was in 1994 when comet shoemaker Levi uh, IX slammed into Jupiter. Given the loss rates, it is easy to compute the maximum age of comets, and without a source for new comets, there should be none if the Earth and solar system are billions or even hundreds of millions of years old. Evolutionary astronomers originally answered this problem by claiming that comets must come from the Cooper belt beyond the orbit of Neptune, which supposedly hosts short period comets, that is, comets with orbits under 200 years. This theory is no longer held by secular scientists, as evidence suggests it cannot produce comets consistent with known objects that orbit the sun. Scientists have thus proposed a much larger, a much more distant, theoretical, and I underline theoretical, earth cloud as the source of comets. There is no evidence for the supposed earth cloud. But we do have comets where none should be. Perhaps God didn't create just the earth, but also the solar system. And perhaps it isn't billions of years old. And so we see that there's a lot of contradictory evidence to the evolutionary model of the way that uh, the Earth was created and formed and how we got to where we're at. Uh, I'd just like to say that there's a lot more evidence of what I've just briefly skimmed here. And uh, the uh, journal articles on both sides of the fence are very, very interesting and make for some uh, good reading. At this point in the video, it might be good to discuss a few questions that I've had about dinosaurs and perhaps explore a few of the answers that I've come across. The first question I have is, well, if the dinosaurs existed at the same time as Adam and Eve, why didn't the dinosaurs eat Adam and Eve? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Initially, all the beasts and fowls, etc., uh, only ate plants. They didn't eat each other. Uh, that's recorded in Genesis chapter 1, verse 29 and 30. However, by the time the flood got here, the scriptures say that all flesh, all flesh had corrupted itself and the earth was filled with violence. So by the time the flood got here, there were predators and there were prey. The next question that I wondered about is, were there dinosaurs at the time that Noah built the ark? And if so, did they get on the ark? Well, the answer is, first of all, Noah took every beast with him on the ark. There wasn't any uh, kind of beast that was left behind. So I assume that, yes, dinosaurs got on the ark. But then if they did, how did they possibly fit? Well, that boils down to a couple of uh, factors. The first one being how many different kinds of dinosaurs were there that Noah had to put on the ark. Well, if you will uh, look at it today, um, even now as we I speak, there are 700 named species of dinosaurs. But the problem is uh, the way universities work that you either publish or perish. And the way a dinosaur uh, PhD paleontologist gets promoted and published is by finding a new species of dinosaurs. So there's a tremendous incentive to find uh, new dinosaurs. The um, other thing that kind of makes this difficult is that 
it's somewhat rare to find an entire dinosaur skeleton intact. What they find instead is a bone here and a bone there. So Dr. Doe finds the um, arm bone of a young dinosaur and publishes it as a brand new species, a Doosaurus. And later, Dr. Smith finds the leg bone of the same dinosaur, but maybe it's much older and much larger. And he concludes he's found a new species named the Smithosaurus. They both publish and they both uh, keep their jobs. Dogs constitute one species of animals today. There's little dogs and there's big dogs and all different shapes of dogs. Uh, the thing that's interesting about dogs is that they can mate between all the different breeds. So uh, we know that they're all one species. However, if all we were looking at were bones of dogs, it's not too hard to see how one would conclude that a leg bone from a dachshund would be a different species than the skull of a Great Dane. And so we might be concluding that there's multiple species when actually there's only one. However, the scriptures don't talk about Noah putting different species of animals on the ark. It talks about different kinds. Creation scientists believe that there may have been as few as 60 different kinds of dinosaurs. And so we see that there may not have been that many dinosaurs that Noah had to take care of on his ark. But it's not only the number, but it's the size. So what is the average size of a dinosaur? Well, it turns out that the average dinosaur was the size someplace between a chicken and a goat. Yes, there were some very large dinosaurs, but that's not the rule. Uh, most of the time they were sm much smaller. And the next question is, is how big were the dinosaurs that he put on the ark? He didn't have to wait for the brontosaurus to get uh, the size of a school bus. What uh, dinosaurs do is they hatch from eggs. And there's a limit on the size of an egg that... Um, in order to get larger, the shell would become so thick to keep the egg from falling apart while it's just sitting there that the dinosaur wouldn't ever be able to get out. So there's a limit on the size of the egg. So even the great big giant brontosaurus uh, started out somewhat small. Noah could have taken juvenile, um, much younger dinosaurs with him. And it's very conceivable that you could take 60 different pair of dinosaurs uh, that are much smaller than uh, what we think of and get them to fit on the ark very easily. If uh, Noah only put uh, small dinosaurs on the ark, how can we find um, fossils that are so big? Well, a little bit of research uh, turned out um, to be kind of interesting because what I found out is that there are four kinds of animals that grow just as long as they live amphibians, some fish, uh, lizards, and uh, interestingly kangaroos. I don't know how kangaroos got in there, but they keep growing as long as they live. Well, how long did Adam live? Methuselah, uh, people way back then. Well, they, they lived uh, almost a thousand years. So if you had a lizard that kept growing for a thousand years, how big would it get? I would assume that uh, at the beginning when Adam and Eve uh, came out of the garden, that everything was young. I assume Adam and Eve were young, and that all the animals were young. But over time, they grew and they grew and they grew, and uh, by the time uh, the flood got here, there were some that were very, very old. Interestingly, I googled the world's largest crocodile, and I found out that there was a crocodile that was caught, put in a zoo, and had lived uh, the life of a crocodile, which is about 70 years, and it grew to over 20 feet long. How long would that uh, crocodile have gotten if it had been allowed to live instead of 70 years, 700 years? Would it then be much larger? Probably. So this is one explanation for how the dinosaurs got to be so very large, is that they just simply live a long time and kept growing and growing and growing.
Another question that I've had, and I presume other people, is uh, why don't we see dinosaurs today? I mean, why did they go extinct? Secular science asserts that there have been five mass extinctions over the approximately 500 million years the life has supposedly existed on the Earth. Creation science suggests that the dinosaurs actually generally became extinct after the flood for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, in terms of extinctions, there's a lot more uh, plants that have gone extinct than there have been animals. And in fact, if you think about what would happen if you submerge the entire planet for a year and a half under a flood, and some parts even longer, what would that do to vegetation? So it's very likely that the dinosaurs and the animals that got off of the ark were facing a very new, different world than the world that they knew prior to uh, the flood and entering the ark. Uh, some of this may have affected dinosaurs very dramatically. Another reason why we don't see at least very, very large dinosaurs is because after the flood, life span decreased. Uh, we could presume that this was not only true for man, but also for the animals. And therefore, you don't end up with uh, lizards living for nearly a thousand years and growing extremely large. Uh, third reason is that uh, predator behavior, apparently, from what we see today, continued after the flood. And finally, many dinosaurs may have become extinct after the flood because people simply hunted them for food until they became extinct. Well, another question about dinosaurs that I've asked is, uh, is there any evidence that there have been dinosaurs living fairly recently? And it turns out that yes, there actually is. One of the most common uh, stories or myths that is shared by cultures all around the globe are legends about dragons. Not only do dragons look like dinosaurs, but they are so recent that we even have legends of people killing dragons, dragon slayers, uh, through the medieval times, etc. Ancient literature from around the world is filled with references to frightening monsters which display striking similarities to one another, as well as to modern scientific descriptions of dinosaurs and other extinct reptiles. These globe-spanning similarities are hard to explain if the creatures mentioned in these ancient texts are purely myths. How did ancient people around the world know about these animals and how they looked and acted if they had never actually seen them alive? One example is in the Bible in Job chapter 40. What I find interesting is that whatever this animal was, it was really large and had a tail as big as a cedar tree. That doesn't seem to describe a hippopotamus or an elephant, does it? Take a minute to just read this scripture. Not only is there evidence for recent dinosaurs in legends and scriptures and literature, but also in ancient art. Now I have to say that one has to be a little careful here because there are unscrupulous people who have created frauds in order to get lots of money by pretending like they have dinosaur related art. But I think I've been pretty careful in some of the examples that I'm going to show you, even though I will have to say that these few examples just are the tip of the iceberg of what's out there. This particular slide shows an artifact uh, from Mesopotamia, uh, Jasper Cylinder Seal, and it's uh, about uh, 3500 BC is when the object was uh, created. It's currently housed at the Louvre. Notice uh, the long neck um, sauropods on the carving. It's pretty cool. You've got to ask where did the artist uh, get the model to present something with long necks and long tails and things like this to make it look just like a dinosaur. This slide depicts a beautiful mosaic 
that was actually one of the wonders of the second century world. It is housed just south of Rome. It depicts Nile scenes from Egypt all the way up to Ethiopia. The top portion of this piece of art is believed to depict African animals being hunted by black-skinned warriors. These Ethiopians are pursuing what appears to be some type of dinosaur. The Greek letters above the reptilian animal are K-R-O-K-O-D-I-L-O-P-A-R-D-A-L-I-S, Crocodiloparodalus. I hope I said that somewhat right. It's literally translated as crocodile leopard. The picture on this slide was drawn by North American Anasazi Indians that lived in the uh, area that's now become Utah between 150 BC and 1200 AD. Even anti-creationists agree that it resembles a dinosaur and that the brownish film which is hardened over the picture along with the pitting and the weathering attest to the fact that it's very old. This petroglyph was discovered in 2012 by Jeremy Springfield on a trip to Hidden Mountain just outside of Las Lunas, New Mexico. What do you think the ancient Pueblo peoples were intending to depict if it's not some type of a dinosaur from that region? Deep in the jungles of Cambodia are ornate temples and palaces from the Khmer civilization. One such temple Tapram abounds with stone statues and relief art. Almost every square inch of the gray sandstone is covered with detail carvings. These depict familiar animals like monkeys, deer, horses, elephants, water buffalo, parrots, and lizards. However, one column contains an intricate carving of a stegosaur-like creature. Note the upright posture, huge tail, plates on the lower left, how could artisans decorating an 800-year-old Buddhist temple know what a dinosaur looked like when Western science only began assembling dinosaur skeletons in the last two centuries? At some time between 1517 and 1518 A.D., Leonardo da Vinci uh, drew a picture entitled Cats, Lions, and a Dragon. It is now part of the royal collection housed at Buckingham Palace. The cats are all drawn with incredible realism and detail that could only come from personal observation. The single dragon bears a remarkable likeness to a small sauropod dinosaurs. The dinosaurs were not discovered in Europe for another three centuries. So what did Leonardo base his dragon drawing on? France is known for its beautiful chateaus built at the close of the Middle Ages and early 1500s. Many of these have dramatic dragon illustrations carved into their walls, ceilings, and furniture. These are called salamanders based on a legendary salamander that could survive fire. They are different than the salamanders we know today in that they have long necks, scales, prominent teeth, powerful claws, and an upright posture. This is perhaps my favorite slide. In 1496, the Bishop of Carlisle, Richard Bell, was buried in Carlisle Cathedral in far northern England near the Scottish border. The tomb is inlaid with brass, having various animals engraved upon it. All of these animals are drawn very carefully to look exactly what they are. Birds, dogs, eels, bats, fox, they are all common animals. There was nothing mythological in all of these animals. However, included with all of the common animals that we know about today, there were two long-necked creatures, again appearing way before scientists started assembling the skeletons of dinosaurs. Wow, they sure look like long necks to me. Secular science and creation scientists differ on a number of things. What I have here in this slide is a list of global events that have dramatically or will dramatically affect the earth. All of these events 
are in the scriptures, none of these events are taught in school. All of these events have had dramatic impacts on the earth or will yet have dramatic impacts on the earth. The start with the creation and the fall of man, the taking of the city of Enoch up into heaven, the global flood of Noah. Five generations later, the earth is divided. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ and all of the changes to the physical earth that occurred at that time. And yet to come, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is it any wonder that Nephi would warn us that in our day, the precepts of men would be particularly dangerous and very, very hurtful to the Lord and his program to not believe in any of these things. We are told in Doctrine and Covenants, section 101, starting with verse 32, that, Yea, verily I say unto you, in that day when the Lord shall come, he shall reveal all things, things which have passed, and hidden things which no man knew, things of the earth, by which it was made, and the purpose and the end thereof, things most precious, things that are above, things that are beneath, things that are in the earth, and upon the earth, and in heaven. Why would Jesus need to reveal all of these things if the scientists already have it right? I would just like to say, I am so glad that there are evidences that contradict what modern secular science says so that I don't have to worry and lose my testimony of the Savior Jesus Christ and the Gospel of Jesus Christ because I'm hung up on the precepts of men.